Yeah. Uh, I don't know how much the story has changed. But it's the same, nothing environmental, no metrics. Okay. You want me to say and back on the pipelines? No, no, no. Administrations. Uh, I don't want to read the whole thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. For the reporting purposes. Yeah, yeah. Rachel Bronson really hit the point about the No. Yeah. Both sides of dig. We have the pond all the way along. Yes. Duncan Wood. Hi. Carson, Hi. Nice, to you. nice to meet you. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good, thank you so much for coming. Everybody in from the we'll put this together. Jordy, Ken Hughes. Ken Hughes. Oh, Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Hi, how are you? I'm Jordy. Stretch my legs and then we'll come back and we'll kick off. Hi, Hi, how are you, sir? Good to see you. Nice to see you. Made it into town? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. You're staying right nearby, right? Yeah, so just across the road. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so you're down for a few days? I'm um, here just till 4 p.m. today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I came in last I'm on a night. flight at 341, okay. allegedly to Chicago, so we'll see. Yeah, I'm allegedly going to Pennsylvania right after this. Mm. Okay. Uh, just on border crossing. Pennsylvania is very active in industry. A couple Canadian firms. What kind of stuff? So, uh, you know a Canadian firm by the name of Plenary Group? Mike Morasco's. Where are they from? Uh, no, actually BC, but um, they just won a uh, they just won a P3 bid to build 550 bridges across Pennsylvania. It's a big, it's uh, about a billion dollar contract. Yeah, and also in New York, <laughs> LaGuardia Airport. So we have also a couple Canadian companies that are shortlisted on that. And also a massive. Okay, we're ready for panel two. <clears throat> Again, for those of you who came late, my name's David Biet. I'm director of the Canada Institute here. And our next panel is on North American oil and gas futures. And we are pretty much sticking to oil and gas here. And again, in the context of infrastructure. But first, I'd like to give some brief um, biographical comments on folks. Um, Shirley Neff, to my immediate left, is Senior Advisor for the U.S. Energy Information Administration. She has extensive public and private energy sector experience, including in pipelines. Prior to joining EIA, she was the economist for the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, where she had responsibility for policy and market issues concerning fuels markets. To her left, Ken Hughes. Ken is the former Alberta Energy Minister. He pre he previously served as chair of the Headwaters Health Authority, chairman for Wenzel Downhole Limited, and was a founder of Alpine Insurance and Financial. He comes to us from Alberta today. And to his left, Jordi Herrera. He is the former Mexican Energy Secretary. Herrera served previously as chief of the Investments Unit and as Undersecretary for Planning, both in the Mexican Secretary of Energy. Later, he was CEO of Pemex Gas, and in September 2011, he was appointed Secretary of Energy by President Felipe Calderon. So we're going to start off with Shirley, who's going to has some slides, and she's going to give us a context for the discussion that we'll be having on this that will sort of situate with some graphs and some other maps on what's going on here and why are we having this conversation on infrastructure. OK. Thank you very much, David. And I'd like to thank you and Duncan for accepting me as a substitute for Administrator Siminski with this very distinguished panel. Um, I will not give the typical EIA presentation here. I have a few slides that will provide some context from our recent annual and international energy outlooks. Um, and unlike many other outlooks, uh, which usually incorporate at least some expected value and of policy changes that significantly influence energy outcomes, EIA's outlooks are totally policy neutral. They're based on existing laws and regulations. So uh, one thing I should point out here is that in the international outlooks, um, we settled these early in 2014 before all of the uh, transitions for the, the uh, restructuring in Mexico had been completed. So they're cautiously optimistic. 
Um, and as is the case with all data and analyses from EIA, the views expressed here are EIAs alone and do not represent those of the Department of Energy or the administration. And I will try to minimize my own personal comments. I'll be very clear when it's not an EIA position. So I will start off with a couple of uh, brief slides just to give you some context. Okay, so they are moving. Um, just to show you how significant this, this growth is, uh, prices, current prices aside, um, when we look at the incremental growth of crude and condensate production in North America and how it's expected to affect um, global supplies, that uh, combination of the U.S., Canada, and Mexico for 2025 eclipses uh, the total increase in OPEC. Now, that's based, obviously, on the assumptions that um, EIA is used for what the market looks like from a demand side, as well as production growth in other parts of the world. So this is a significant um, uh, growth in liquids production that we're talking about here. Um, secondly, just to break it out a little bit more, and, and again, bear in mind what I said about our cautious optimism about Mexico is that the two largest contributors to this are Canada and the U.S., and especially focus on 2025. Um, in past e international energy outlooks, Mexico has um, not shown an increase. So what we're looking at here, just in the, the minimal amount, is near-term investment made by Pemex, and in the longer term, the impact of changes in the liberalization of the energy laws. Um, in the 2015 International Energy Outlook, which the, we're working on right now, it'll be a much more expansive outlook than the, the brief version we put out this year. Uh, we are looking much more extensively at Mexico, so expect to see a, a significant change in, in how this all lines up for the Americas. Um, next, I just thought it would be useful to put up a map so that you could see, one, where these really prospective areas are in the U.S. and how they affect the cross-border issues. Um, this is a map just of the North American shale plays, and you can see the, the light violet areas are the major plays, and then the, the most prospective are the Bakken, it's the big round pink uh, blob on the U.S.-Canadian border. Um, that production in North Dakota is at around a million barrels a day today, and the Bakken extends well up into Canada. And then, of course, above that and, and to the west is the prolific uh, oil sands area. And then to the south, on the U.S.-Mexico border, you see the, the Eagle Ford, the, the lowest big pink blob with, uh, that's identified as Eagle Ford. That is one of the most prolific um, plays uh, right now and, and is, has grown very, very rapidly. And that extends down into Mexico. The Eagle Ford is both uh, gas and uh, oil. And I'll just leave it at that. I think it's a useful slide. It hasn't been updated in a little while. I think we will we'll be doing that at some point in the future, but it gives you some context. Next, I thought it was useful just to show this slide that we put together not too long ago showing all the various border crossing uh, locations. There are a few smaller ones that aren't on here. I think a lot of people think that we don't have a lot of infrastructure across the U.S.-Mexican border. We do. Um, it's mostly natural gas pipelines and uh, electric transmission. There is one um, uh, oil crossing point at El Paso. It's the one blue spot. And then, of course, to the north, you know, we've had an extensive uh, energy trade across the U.S.-Canadian border for decades. Um, that's not to say that it's adequate at the moment or that it um, is configured in the right directions given all the changes that are occurring, especially in the United States. So in the International Energy Outlook for 2014, I just want to show how dramatically we see the change with the, the reforms in Mexico. It certainly shows um, a lot of long-term uncertainty, but with the uncertainty on the upside. Um, Mexico has 10 billion barrels of proved oil reserves and potentially large volumes of hydrocarbons in Mexican territory in the deep water Gulf of Mexico. Now, none of that is in Mexico's proved reserves. Um, of course, the uh, U.S. and Mexico are eclipsed by Canada's proved reserves, but we'll 
leave it at that. It's still significant from a global standpoint. Um, earlier this year, um, EIA put out a report titled Liquid Fuels and Natural Gas in the Americas. Uh, it was released in January, and it was the impetus for this was that there were several factors. One, the U.S. had become a net exporter of refined product. And as refined product exports were growing, it was increasingly apparent that the majority of that trade was with the Americas, certainly Canada and Mexico, which are the two largest trading partners of the United States for crude and products. Uh, crude varies a little bit um, with Saudi Arabia, but as far as the top uh, two, but um, uh, the refined product trade is extensive. Uh, Mexico exports a lot of crude to the U.S., uh, is refined in Gulf Coast refineries and re-exported to Mexico. Um, the trade with the rest of the Americas is extensive also, and I would recommend that report to any of you who haven't seen it. Um, next, I'm going to switch a little bit to natural gas. Um, natural gas production in the Americas has been growing pretty dramatically, not just the North America, but the entire uh, Western Hemisphere. And the U.S. now is the largest producer of oil and natural gas in the world, uh, exceeding Saudi Arabia and Russia for the, the two combined. So I know we're talking a lot about oil here this morning, but uh, don't, don't forget about the importance of natural gas. Um, this is an interesting graph for the United States. Uh, we now expect that with the dramatic growth in natural gas development, especially in the Northeast, in the Marcellus, and, which is in, mostly in Pennsylvania and a little bit in West Virginia, and uh, the Utica Shale in um, Ohio, the U.S. EIA is projecting that the U.S. will become a net um, exporter of natural gas about 2017. This is from our 2014 annual energy outlook, the reference case. So that does, doesn't even take into consideration, you know, potentially a higher resource base, which is what I have here on the next slide, just to show you how dramatic um, the change could be in U.S. Um, natural gas development and trade. Now, on the left side is the reference case. Now, you can see that the U.S. has been importing significant natural gas from Canada, and we certainly expect to do that. Now, part of that has to do with where the natural gas is located in the U.S., where it's located in Canada, and where those markets are. So we have had extensive cross-border trade for decades. Um, we expect to see more exports to Mexico and also exports to Canada, and then um, the growth of LNG exports. Um, in the high resource case, uh, you can see that uh, we expect to see, you know, continued trade across the border, but potentially even higher LNG exports. So I think I will leave it there. Um, that gives you a little bit of context. I think whenever we talk to our Canadian colleagues or Mexican colleagues, there's always the comment, well, of course, the U.S. is there in the middle and drives a lot of this. So at any rate, I will leave it at that. and, and uh, we can come back to questions later. So, Ken, you want to pick up from there and sort of? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, David. And uh, Shirley, thank you for that uh, set context setting uh, set of slides, uh, because I think what it demonstrates is uh, uh, we're all in this together. Uh, and uh, the, the sooner that people in public policy uh, recognize that, the, the better all of us will be uh, in the long haul. Let me start by. Uh, acknowledging uh, Rob Merrifield's uh, comments this morning. He speaks for the government of Alberta. I have the good fortune of speaking for nobody but myself. Uh, although with uh, some having been well informed, having served as the energy minister in Alberta, uh, I stepped out of politics in the last couple of years. It's a, a last couple of months. It's a 12-step um, process. Um, and uh, I'm very early in my 12-step program of being clean of politics, um, evidence of which is that I'm here actually today. It's uh, evidence that I haven't, I'm not completely clean yet. Um, but I can tell you that I speak as, a, as an entrepreneur who, um, uh, who has uh, served in uh, the House of Commons in Ottawa, who has uh, worked in the energy industry, and who has been effectively the uh, trustee in chief for Albertans for the third largest energy reserves in the world, which is what Alberta has. 
Um, and so I have a very, I can give you the elevator pitch of what I'm going to say. The elevator pitch is the following. Hello America, we're the Canadians. We have a lot of energy and we're going to produce it. And we're going to ship it to you, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, or not. Um, and we know you're going to like it. Um, and because we're your closest neighbor. And we are, uh, together with Mexico, of course, um, we, are, we are here for the long haul. We are resilient. We're tough as nails. The weather here today is nothing. You, you want bad weather? Come and visit us this time of year. It was 20 below at home last week. Um, and we are able to produce remarkable resources. The oil sands 30 years ago was moose pasture with no economic value in the eyes of the, the, the world's economy. Today it is recognized with reserves as the third largest oil reserves in the world behind Venezuela and Saudi Arabia in the order of magnitude of 170 uh, billion barrels. So we got a lot of uh, really interesting resource. We don't even have to go look for it. We know exactly where it's sitting. And we're going to develop that. We're going to develop it in the most environmentally responsible way we can with immense uh, technical capacity that we have demonstrated in bringing this from moose pasture to an asset of immense value. Um, and there's probably two or three things just to put it in context. Um, some, um, all of you will have heard of uh, Pareto's law, uh, the 80-20 law. Well, Alberta has roughly 80% of the Canadian production of oil out of one province. And roughly 80% of the production of oil in Alberta is from the oil sands. And about 80% of the oil sands is actually way too deep to mine. So it's going to be developed by what we call uh, steam-assisted gravity uh, drainage. So it's going to be designed, and the footprint on the surface looks very much like conventional oil development. Uh, and that will be 80% of the development of the oil sands over the, the next uh, few decades. And so we're here. Um, we're part of the market. What I would say is... Um, um, even with a great debate, and I really appreciate the, the, the slide that showed how many contact points there are and access points between America and Canada today. There's like 80 pipelines back and forth across that border already. What's one more? Um, and it's actually one more that helps serve America's needs, not going offshore somewhere else, just to be clear. Um, I've seen some comments in the in the public domain recently uh, that I think are regrettably um, unlikely to be the future reality. Um, so we have, um, uh, I think the lesson of the last couple of years is the markets work. We felt very concerned about the constraints that we had on, on, uh, on getting our product to market in Alberta. And we actually um, have, I was part of a cabinet that worked hard to help ensure that we uh, tried to expand our access uh, to Tidewater because uh, what we need is access to get our, that next incremental bo uh, barrel of oil to Tidewater so that we get optimum price for it. And um, uh, remarkably, the market worked the railway systems, people invested in railway capacity. If you're an Albertan and your interest is to see the best price for an Albertan barrel of oil, you want to see people overinvest in railways and railway capacity. And maybe, they've, maybe they're doing that. Um, that's not a bad thing from an Alberta perspective because you want that last barrel of oil to get to tide water and get optimum price. And so um, I was part of the cabinet and took forward to cabinet a recommendation to uh, use our own resources because the government of Alberta is actually the owner on behalf of Albertans of 
80 or 90 percent of the oil in the ground in Alberta. Um, and the government of Alberta can accept royalties instead of as cash, you can take it as in kind, as oil. So we made a strategic decision to use that as a strategic tool to say we will commit 100,000 barrels a day to ensure that Energy East makes it all the way to St. John, New Brunswick, um, and that we demonstrate our serious commitment to building infrastructure. Sometimes you have to do exceptional things in public policy to achieve the right outcome, to prime the pump to get things working. And uh, that's what we were prepared to do, and I was the minister that took that forward. I'm very proud of that, uh, that accomplishment uh, from my term when I was uh, energy minister for less than two years. Um, but the long and the short of it is, we're here to stay. We're your best friend. We're your closest neighbor. We've got the longest undefended border in the world. Um, and um, we're going to be producing oil. And we welcome you as a, as a customer. You've been a great customer. Eric has been a great customer uh, f for all of the history of the, of the energy business in Alberta. In fact, a great participant in the development of those resources. Um, and uh, always will be. And um, we're going to sell our resources uh, when we produce them to America. We're increasingly seeing those resources being sold elsewhere. We're getting them to market, even without easy pipeline access in some cases. Um, oil has been shipped as far as, uh, as Europe. It can get to India from the east coast of Canada easier than from the west coast of Canada once we get Energy East in place. Um, we, um, uh, even Switzerland, even landlocked Switzerland has become a customer of Alberta, and we're displacing Russian supplies. This should be good. Um, and so we have, um, uh, in long, in long and the short of it is um, uh, we look forward to a long and fruitful working relationship with uh, America and with, uh, and with Mexico. I would say that I think Mexico is, has a really exciting opportunity. Um, and I have great confidence that much will come of it for the North American. The, uh, I have one picture here which is really hard to see, but it's so dramatic that it tells you the, the story about the potential. The Gulf of Mexico here, the pink is the development on the U.S. side of the border. And south of the line is where is, is Mexico. That is, some of it's unknown territory, but it's probably pretty prospective. Uh, and that's a great opportunity for the energy industry that is so resilient, so tough, so able to work together uh, with uh, Mexican partners, Canadians, Americans, working together with Mexican partners to develop uh, and ensure that North America is working together very effectively. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ken. And I, <clears throat> yes, as North America does work together, let's hear from our other partner in North America, Jordi Herrera. Thank you. Um, let me start saying that uh, 10 years ago, this talk would be uh, related with how Mexico, uh, how Pemex is related with a success history uh, because uh, we were producing at that time uh, more than 3 million barrels per day. But only a decade uh, from there, uh, as today, uh, our production declined heavily. And now our production should be around 2.3 million of barrels daily. And if you look at the numbers, you could say, and, and some did in, in the past, that Mexico was running out of oil. And that's not true. Uh, I, I always uh, keep saying that um, Mexico does not have a problem related with resources. We have a problem related with money and it's kind of different. And uh, we were having this problem because uh, all the investment needed to develop those barrels uh, were coming from uh, taxpayers. So uh, at first with huge, easy, low cost areas, it was pretty simple, let me put it that way, to get enough money to get uh, the production in, in, in this uh, one area, uh, the one shown in the map, 
in the south part uh, of the Gulf of Mexico. From one single field, we were producing more than two million barrels. It was too easy, it was too cheap, and we forgot about the rest. Uh, that area uh, named uh, Cantarel uh, now uh, is almost uh, dying, let me put it that way, from two million barrels now to 200,000 barrels so uh, daily. Uh, so now we don't have Cantarel, we don't have uh, any big replacement uh, uh, for, for production. But in the past five years, uh, Pemex managed to bring more than a million barrels from different fields onshore shallow waters uh, we don't have production at this moment in in deep or ultra deep water but uh, we were producing a lot of of, of oil and gas coming out from uh, several other uh, fields and areas uh, now if you look uh, to the uh, to the next decade everything uh, once again is going to change in a big way uh, and why is this? Because the main purpose of the reform was to uh, to get, uh, in a simple way, to get money. So now everybody is allowed to participate in the energy sector so we can develop our resources. We think that we can increase uh, production once again, not only because unconventional, mainly uh, Eagle 4 area. We have five different uh, regions related uh, with unconventional. Uh, we do have uh, the biggest area or possibility related uh, with uh, deep and ultra deep water in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and now we, we now have the tool to develop those resources. Money is coming down to, to Mexico. And uh, what could be the new, the new uh, arrangement uh, related with production? If you look only at Texas and, and you can give the same uh, probability to develop resources as much as in Texas, just in the same region, is the same field, uh, those are the same conditions, we can get from that specific area uh, another uh, one million barrel per day uh, in the years to come. And if you look at the Gulf of Mexico, only deep water uh, fields, and, and, and you compare that uh, on, on the United States part, you can say that you can gain another million barrel, perhaps a little bit more, but uh, let's keep it simple. So developing only two specific known areas, Mexico could go from 2.5 in, in average in the past five years, from 2.5 uh, millions of barrels per day up to, let's say, 4.5, perhaps 5 uh, um, million barrels per day. That means a lot in terms of production, but that's also a problem in terms of the market, in terms of what is going to happen in the region related with prices, related not only with products, but also uh, uh, with the needs uh, within the area. Uh, One million barrels of our production goes into the market. The revenue uh, taken from that represents one third of the national uh, of the total national income. So for us, it's very um, tempting to increase production to get more money to spend in some other uh, areas of the country, and uh, mainly infrastructure. But that's only uh, one part of the equation. If you look uh, at the needs in terms of demand, yes, we produce. A lot of uh, a lot of oil, but we we are importing half our, of our needs in terms of uh, regular gasoline. That means 400,000 barrels per day. That is almost as much as Colombia in terms of uh, daily consumption. Uh, so uh, in our case, we have uh, to make this combination with the amount of money needed in the economy, mainly for the government. To develop the rest uh, of the of the infrastructure needed uh, across the country, but at the same time we need that production to reduce our um, imports for every product. If you look at gasoline, at diesel, jet fuel, uh, if you look at LPG, or if even with natural gas, we are net importers of uh, basic products. But we do have the resources. So now with the with the reform. I think the most important equation is that Mexico, for the first time, is going to have uh, money uh, to develop those resources. Uh, 
with that amount of money, everything is going to change a lot in the country because that's the only way that we can grow uh, in, in, in a big way. Uh, once again, if you look at Texas, they created uh, just uh, in, in 2013 uh, almost a million uh, jobs, new jobs uh, in one single state. Uh, the, the, the total creation of jobs in Mexico in this year is less than that. So if we uh, could develop those resources, this million uh, barrels for unconventional and another million uh, coming out from the Gulf of Mexico, coming out from uh, deep and ultra deep water. It's, it's not going to be only about oil and gas production, oil and gas money. It's not only about that. It's the only or the last possibility for our country to, to get uh, the right speed of growth that the economy needs. It's the only way to uh, fight against poverty because uh, that's the only way to, to get money uh, coming out from, from elsewhere. And that's the only way for us to be part of the dynamic of the region. But uh, there are going to be uh, some challenges uh, there, big ones. Uh, my main concern is related not with uh, insecurity. Uh, I think uh, we are fighting uh, organized crime we are not at war and, and it's a huge difference uh, you can go uh, you can travel throughout the country without a problem uh, there's no bombing and uh, it's, it's not a country at war we're fighting organized crime and it's a different scale it's a different strategy also uh, what we uh, must uh, look into the future is how this is going to affect the balance in terms of the market in, in the region, North America, because only 10 years ago, we were the most expensive area in terms of, uh, uh, of the price of natural gas. Now we are the cheapest. What's going to happen in a decade? Uh, at that time, 10 years ago, prices of oil were uh, around $50. Uh, the price of gas, natural gas, uh, taking uh, South Texas uh, index, uh, were uh, almost in $14. And now it seems that we are heading back to that scenario in time, but not related with gas. So we have to look carefully and what can, uh, what could happen in terms of the relation between production, prices, growth, and at the end, uh, this equation should be useful for the, the three countries, not only for the uh, United States. Uh, the, the simple question in, in our scenario is, if United States is going to produce more oil and gas, uh, our ex exports are going where? Or how are we going to deal with our production? It's not easy to say we're going to send those barrels to, to Asia, to China. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, not only in terms of logistics, it's complicated in terms of politics, in terms of, of, of foreign policy. Uh, but at the end, I think this is the, the best opportunity in terms of collaboration between countries to get a common policy related not only uh, uh, in terms of exports or in terms of market with the rest of the world, but in terms of the their right uh, path in uh, in production, the right way to make a, a real market inside the NAFTA area, and from there getting the best possibilities out of this uh, huge opportunity that we are facing now. Well, thank you. Um, since this panel, well, you all talked about um, sort of overview and particularly oil. Can we just spend a little bit of time on gas? Um, since the panel does have gas in the title. Um, I'd like to at least touch on that. Um, and then I have another big question, then we can get into questions from the audience. So I don't know who wants to start on that. You, please. Um, well, I don't really have much of Jordy. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> for us, it's pretty simple. Ten years ago, uh, because of prices, uh, it was possible for Mexico to develop a natural gas coming out from shallow waters in the Gulf of Mexico because the level was a, a good one to make a profitable production of dry gas. It's, it's not always dry, but uh, let me 
put it in, in that sentence so, so we can understand clearly uh, the example. With current prices, we cannot develop those resources. Uh, the reference now should be uh, slightly uh, below four dollars in, in Mexico. So it's not enough to develop uh, dry gas in the Gulf of Mexico. So we have to move from there to the Eagle 4 area. Uh, once again, it's only an example to produce liquids and to use the gas that is coming with with liquids. But maybe the price is just in, in the break even point and we need a, a bigger uh, price. Uh, so this could be a, a real solution in, in our case. But it's, it's not only related with the resources uh, on the floor, uh, it's related with infrastructure. If you look once again into Texas, Texas has 100,000 kilometers of uh, pipelines only for natural gas. In Mexico, the whole country, we have only uh, 15,000 kilometers. So there's a huge difference in terms of infrastructure. If a company wants to go to Mexico at this moment and develop resources, the problem is going to be infrastructure. Um, so once again, Yes, it's fairly good for the economy to have a low price of natural gas only if it's related in terms of production with liquids. Without li liquids does not make economic sense and nobody is going to give public money to develop a dry gas. Uh, not in our case, uh, we don't have enough uh, money to, to do that. Uh, so we have to be uh, looking at the market to understand the new economics related with the possibilities of getting production uh, in, in the combination of liquids and uh, gas. But at the same time, we have to invest a lot of money in our case, uh, constructing or creating new infrastructure. Our infrastructure should go from the north to the, to the south because in the past production areas were in the south part of the country going up north to the three main big cities mexico guadalajara and monterrey so it's not only to re uh, reuse or re uh, reconstruct current system we have to build a new system because the new areas of production are very far from the old uh, production areas uh, if you uh, give a rough uh, number in terms of production, uh, Mexico is producing now six BCF, six billion uh, cubic feet uh, daily. Uh, our production is also declining uh, because of the reason I was saying uh, our production mainly in, the, in shallow waters in the Gulf uh, does not have the right uh, price to, to develop more resources. Uh, but with the new unconventional areas, it's not only shale, it's, it's the combination of all the possibilities, we could double our production in, in a decade. Uh, so it's going to be very important for us to develop that amount of gas for our own uh, uh, power system, for an example. Half of our production comes out from fuel oil, so it, at this moment it's very expensive. It's not as expensive as a month ago, but it's, it's very expensive. Uh, so yes, once again, and uh, just like with oil, we can use in, in terms of uh, our local demand, a lot of the production. But once again, if we don't work this out together as, as NAFTA region, we could affect prices. So we could affect production. And in terms of balance, uh, maybe uh, it's better for, for some regions to use the neighbor production rather than develop uh, their own uh, possibilities. <laughs> so uh, for me, once again, it's about policy. It's about creating a real market, not only for feedstock, but uh, also for products. And from there, uh, taking a more coordinated strategy into the region because uh, after a decade, we are going to look to the rest of the world once we can uh, balance uh, our needs in, in the NAFTA region. Thanks. Um, Alberta, and then maybe you can talk about Canada too? Sure, yeah, it, it's really the same story. Um, Canada and Alberta have a lot of natural gas, a lot of natural gas, something like 72 trillion cubic feet of uh, natural gas in reserves. Our, our annual production 
is um, about eight um, eight BCF. Our, our annual exports are about eight uh, billion cubic feet, and uh, production is about fourteen. Um, and we've got we're long on this stuff, um, and but we all are. Mexico's long on it, and uh, and America's long on it as well. And so part of the conversation in Canada is all about um, how do we find new markets? How do we get this offshore? Uh, I was in uh, Korea and China and Japan last fall, a year ago, in October, as the Minister of Energy. Um, and it's quite clear they're, they're very keen on, um, on diversifying away from their current sources of LNG. Um, and, but they're, they're, not, um, they're not waiting for Canada to get its act together. Uh, they'll take it from whoever gets it uh, shipped. Um, and, um, you know, the, the most recent Russia-China deal was interesting because they were speculating about that in Beijing when I was there. Um, and they were speculating but a bit s uncertain whether it was a good thing uh, to have that big a supply of uh, natural gas from uh, one supplier, that being Russia, in, from Russia in particular. Uh, they'd seen what the Russian supplier is like in, in Europe as well. But it's a big deal, and in fact, uh, it's possible that China's picked up a really good deal for themselves, uh, and it'll be at Russia's expense over time, but we'll see. The impact, though, is upon us here in North America uh, in terms of our ability to get access to markets in, in Asia. It, um, uh, I don't think it's un the, these are not unconnected developments. Um, you can't also talk about natural gas without talking about gas liquids, as uh, Jordy's talked about. Natural gas liquids are a really important economic element of, uh, of uh, the natural gas story. Um, it, Alberta, if, um, if we're wise and we're good and we're lucky, we will uh, add more uh, capacity to add value to natural gas liquids. Uh, there's, uh, since the 1970s, ethane has been a, a key feedstock for a petrochemical industry in Alberta. That came about in part because of deliberate intervention by the government of Alberta at the time under Peter Lougheed uh, to use the tools he had, not financial but regulatory, to ensure that a uh, petrochemical industry started to develop in Alberta. When I was minister, I attended a sod turning for another billion dollars in investment in a plant near central Alberta uh, by Nova, and that was the 11th billion dollars in investment in that plant since the 70s that had come about because of deliberate uh, intervention by the government of Alberta to make sure that the petrochemical industry developed close to the source. We could be doing the same thing. We actually don't have to do anything as a province uh, uh, on, um, on the propane front, uh, but there's butane as well. These liquids are, are quite valuable, and it's really good for the Canadian economy in general to develop those uh, petrochemical industries close to the source. Shirley, the United States or North America? <coughs> okay, one thing I would say about um, the natural gas and the liquids, these shale plays tend to be pretty liquids rich. They also have oil, hydro, um, natural gas liquids, and, and ga dry gas, you know, after separation, or depends on the play. But so there are a lot of liquids, and the volume of natural gas liquids or hydrocarbon gas liquids, as we're calling them, has increased rather dramatically as a result of these shale plays. Um, let me flip over to one of my backup slides here to show you how dramatic this is in the United States and the need for infrastructure. Oops. Okay. So w we have an infrastructure, a natural gas infrastructure in, in the United States that was really built to move natural gas from the Gulf Coast up into the Northeast. So you see these big long line pipelines on this map. Um, you can't see the, the names of them, but they're like natural gas pipeline, uh, Tennessee gas pipeline, Texas Eastern, Transco. You know, these lines for decades were moving gas from the mid-continent, the Gulf Coast, up into the northeast where the, there's a huge natural gas market. A number of them are now being reversed because the production coming out of the incredibly prolific um, shale plays in the northeast, the Marcellus and now the Utica, 
have pushed those out. There have also been additional investments in that area to move, to expand moving that gas from the Marcellus into other areas. There's even one proposal, um, this kind of blew me away, uh, to build a pipeline that would connect with Iroquois and uh, move gas north. Um, so there's a lot of investment going on, some of it new pipe in the ground, some of it uh, reversals. Now that's just the pipe side of it. Um, I'll go back to another slide that I have that will show you what we were looking at in the Americas report on what the, the potential is with LNG. Um, there are a number of regas facilities throughout North America, a number in the United States, and now, you know, a decade ago, uh, we were looking at building regas facilities for imports, and now it's the opposite. And a lot of you probably know that there's a big uh, liquefaction facility being built by Chenier in, the, in Louisiana and the Gulf Coast area. And this map was our effort at showing where there are regas facilities. Those are for imports. Those are the red dots. And then the blue dots are the operating liquefaction facilities. The others, the, the, those that aren't colored in, are the engineering work is being done. They have proposals mostly for exports now. And so the options and the opportunities, as both of my um, colleagues mentioned, are not just for North America and expanding the markets here, but potentially the rest of South America, the rest of the Americas to the south, and to Asia. There's a little tiny dark line that you probably can't see that's the Panama Canal. When the expansion of the canal, canal comes into operation in early 2016 is the, is the current estimate, that new canal will be able to accommodate most of the LNG tankers that are in the marketplace. I think we had a, someone from the, the canal authority speak at the EIA conference this summer, and she said all but the really large tankers out of gutter will be able to transit the canal. So that really opens these natural gas exports to certainly the west coast of South America, but Asia. So there's a lot of infrastructure being developed, being planned, engineering in the works um, for all sorts of optionality, if you will, in, in natural gas. Not to mention the fact that you know, we are increasingly using natural gas for electric power generation in the U.S., and, and that's a large market in Mexico that I know producers in Texas are yeah. happy to have as well. So. Um, Okay, I want to have a, it's probably a big question and um, we don't have time for huge answers, but I mean, Jordy talked about resources and Mexico's lack of infrastructure to get its product to a market. How, what's the difference in what we need, say, from current infrastructure to needed infrastructure to really make this market optimum? Um, and then my other supplemental question, maybe it's too big, is what kind of political infrastructure do we need to do this? <laughs> or we can just go to audience <laughs> questions. <laughs> Start with the easy one. Okay, so, um, well, we need, uh, we need a lot of uh, infrastructure, uh, a lot of its pipelines, um, both for natural gas and, and for, for oil. And sorry, for both for uh, natural gas and for oil, uh, we need on the west coast uh, of Can I'm just talking about a sort of domestic Canadian perspective on the universe. Uh, we need um, LNG plants, probably a couple, uh, to actually be able to export LNG off the west coast, at least to get it started. Uh, we need at least one more pipeline to America, um, and um, uh, perhaps uh, perhaps more. I mean, there's a lot of infrastructure going on around the edges that doesn't involve uh, presidential permits, and, and Enbridge has you know has been like eight billion dollars in investment in pipelines south of. Uh, Cushing uh, to take stuff down to the Gulf Coast, and that's helped us immensely from an Alberta perspective. So uh, there's uh, there's just a lot of capital. What do we need in terms of political? I think we need a. I think we need um, collaboration amongst the the three countries. Uh, I think we need strong collaboration um, with the political will to actually see this as a single market, which it is, 
and ensure that we develop our resources in a sensible way, that we have the infrastructure that is the most sensible economic infrastructure, which includes one or two more pipelines, um, and uh, that we do that collaboratively. We need leadership. Could I just, sure. from a U.S. standpoint, I want to just echo what Rachel Bronson said earlier. Building infrastructure in the United States is really dependent on the companies, the industry, really working at the local level. No matter what the rules are and, and the various authorities, those are the things that create the biggest impediments. And I won't be surprised if that's the case in Mexico. Uh, let me say that uh, five years ago, I came here to to Capital City to to show to the to the U.S. government the new infrastructure plan uh, for the huge uh, pipelines coming out from Texas down to Mexico, and and at that time uh, they they say to me, why didn't you ask first? Uh, so I think this is uh, a pretty good a good example that we cannot look into our own countries without taking uh, the basic communication uh, with, with, the, uh, with the region. And perhaps California should be the best example. How to, uh, how to bring to California the, the right amount of not only power, electricity, but perhaps gasoline, uh, in, in, in our side of, of California, uh, we're developing a lot of renewable energy uh, coming out from wind uh, to give electricity to California because uh, this need uh, in terms of uh, the specific law, so they, they should use renewable energy. But we are not using that electricity for our own system. More than that, that uh, system in California is not interconnected with the rest of the country. So that does not make sense. I mean, uh, it's not only about communication, it's uh, related with um, integrated planning uh, is, is what I see for us uh, from Mexico up to up north uh, to the United States, it's needed. Uh, the relation is so close and in time is going to be closer. Uh, so. Uh, in a decade, at the time, uh, we are going to be able to go to ref different regions. Uh, in terms of logistics, I think it's going to be cheaper to create a new pipeline coming out from Eagle Ford uh, to the Mexican Pacific Coast rather than uh, take uh, create a facility in Texas, uh, bring a ship uh, down to Panama and from Panama to, to Asia. I think this type of collaboration is going to happen in terms of market, but we need leadership and we have to realize that we need each other. Uh, so the best uh, possibilities for the countries, it's going to be related for common goals, common policy, common standards, and a lot of uh, common planning uh, in the future, in the near future. Otherwise, the cost is going to be very high in the non-productive areas and it, it's going to create uh, opportunities for other markets. We are, uh, we as, uh, as Mexico, we're importing LNG from Peru. That's, that's far, and, and that costs a lot of money. And, and our neighbor has a lot of gas and we are not using it. This is a real example, and, and the, the real case is already there. So we have to hurry in terms of getting this possibility in, in the better way for our countries before going elsewhere uh, to give a, a market uh, to any other region. Well, I could carry on this conversation for a long time, but instead of, I don't want to be talking at you. Look at all these questions. Um, I think what I'll do is take three questions and then we'll answer them all at once. So I'll start first here, and then I'm going to go to here, and then I'm going to go to this guy there. So, Yes, uh, Minister Hughes, you- Could you, you identify yourself, sorry, please? Uh, Christian Gomez with the Council of the Americas. Um, I'm curious to, to learn more about the Canadian-Mexico relationship. I know there's been uh, some some Im implications that the Mexican energy reforms are going to benefit Canadian companies that are going to invest. But what sort of cooperation uh, do you do you see existing, and and how do you see that relationship evolving? Uh, 
Hi, I'm uh, Rachel McCormick. I'm head of the Energy and Environment section at the Canadian Embassy here. Uh, thanks, David and Duncan, for organizing this. This is great. Look forward to this. It says first annual, so I'm thinking this could be a regular thing. It's great. Um, so my question, actually, we've had lots of really important conversation about the local um, aspect of siting and infrastructure, et cetera. Not to take away from that, I'd like your comments on sort of the more global geopolitical aspect. Um, I think North America clearly has an important role to play in energy resources that could contribute positively to geopolitical issues, whether it be in the hemisphere or in Europe. I'm just wondering how that factors into your conversations right now and, and if there needs to be more attention to that global aspect as well. <coughs> yes, hello. I'm Walter Earle from National Defense University, Department of Defense. Uh, my question is for Mr. Herrera. Um, and it's about uh, Mexican politics. Uh, in some of the reporting that we've had recently on the political crisis because of the disappearance of the students, uh, there are questions being raised about the major political efforts of, of the president in educational and energy reform. And my question is whether uh, there is going to be political resistance to uh, moving forward with implementing the reform. Thank you. Okay, we're going to need short answers. We've got Canada, Mexico relationship, um, local to global, and political as in as Mexico. So, Jordi, you want to kick off? Short answer. Okay. Um, Canada, Mexico. Uh, now, uh, we, we are very close to Canadian energy companies. Uh, TransCanada is already there building huge pipelines in, in the country. And for the rest of the upcoming experience, it's going to be pretty simple for Canadian companies to, to go down Mexico uh, because they, they, they know two things, in my opinion. They, they, they know how to deal with different type of resources in terms of geology. And that's very useful because we don't have any uh, experience or we don't have even the experts uh, to understand what's uh, under the floor. Uh, to to make that uh, production possible. And the other thing is that uh, they are used uh, to to big uh, uh, big projects, big infrastructure uh, projects. So at the time uh, the public utility uh, CFE asked for uh, co uh, construction companies to develop a pipeline in the Pacific coast, uh, with more than 1,500 kilometers, uh, uh, the Canadian companies uh, just uh, told us, hey, this is uh, pretty obvious for me to, to make this possible. And in Mexico, there are not companies with experience because there were no market. Uh, so I think in time, uh, experience, technology, and the concerns related uh, with environment is going to be very important uh, for us in terms of what uh, what uh, what are our uh, worries related with yes uh, take it uh, take out all the production as much as we can but at the same time taking care of environment mm -hmm. from there um, uh, the things related with politics at this moment in in, in Mexico uh, I will say that uh, it's complicated to understand the the country throughout the media uh, uh, in 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 television you get only to see the worst part of what's going on uh, in Mexico, but it's not every day, it's not everywhere, it's not every Mexican who's saying I, I'm not uh, comfortable with, with the new situation. In terms of, not politics, but uh, let me put it differently, in terms of uh, the, uh, the specific majority that should be needed to change what already happened uh, is going to take perhaps decades to be different because the two major big parties, uh, the, the one that is ruling and the one that used to rule the country, uh, we are pretty convinced that this is the right uh, path. And uh, together we can form uh, perhaps 75% of the majority of the Congress. So. What you see in, in television, what you read in the newspapers, is the extreme left, I, I, I don't even believe that those are parties, is extreme left expressions. Uh, it's only a bunch of people. Uh, it's, it's no more than hundreds, 
uh, uh, Mexico is a 120 million uh, country. Uh, so it's very small. It's important because something is happening, but it's far, uh, in my opinion, to be a concern in terms of the future. It's more about uh, how this administration is um, looking at those specific uh, groups and how to deal with them more than a, a national situation. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, uh, next year we are having uh, midterm elections. More or less is going to be uh, the, the, the same uh, proportion in Congress. From 75 at best, uh, the lowest should be uh, 60. So the worst case scenario is that only uh, the 60 percent of the Congress a lower chamber because a higher is not going to change uh, are going to be part of the same equation and to change the constitution you need two-thirds uh, so i think uh, that mexico is a different country now is not going to change and it's going to take a lot of things to happen in in my country to to think that uh, once again you can form uh, a majority congress to to take back all the the new reforms. Ken, comments? <clears throat> Jordi uh, very uh, eloquent, uh, eloquently uh, identified the relationship between Mexico and Canada and the opportunities there in terms of Canadian business in, in, in Mexico and, and the talent, the, uh, the depth of experience. I mean, Canada is the, fifth, the world's fifth largest oil producer. Uh, so there's a lot of expertise and the the service industry that supports the uh, exploration production companies uh, is one where that is kind of Alberta and Texas uh, joined at the hip in a lot of ways and, and, a lo and really interesting technologies that develop in Alberta end up in Houston pretty quickly and likewise coming back up that direction so this is a there's a real core expertise and there's a there's a I think a uh, an affection between Canada and Mexico that goes well beyond the fact that people like to go there in the winter um, and, and so there's a there's a fabulous opportunity there coming to uh, Rachel's question about uh, leadership um, or sorry about local siting issues and the impact on global uh, uh, gl the global geopolitical aspect of North American energy. I think what's happening um, is really important in North America because we will drive uh, certain other behaviors elsewhere. I mean, just in the last eight months, um, uh, Alberta oil has ended up in Spain, Italy, Singapore, and Switzerland. Uh, there was none there in March, and that happened over the summer. So there's this growth that's largely going out through America at this stage, but not, you know, not entirely. Uh, so what the impact, that's just an example of the impact on other markets. The Europeans go, hallelujah, we, we, we welcome uh, getting away from our dependence upon Russia um, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and we can be a player in that. Um, we also can be a player if we get our act together collectively between America and Canada and the LNG industry, we can be a big player in the Pacific. Shirley, you get the last word if you want it. <clears throat> we'll leave it to the uh, policy experts over here. Okay, <clears throat> well join me in thanking this great panel. <clears throat> We're going to quickly switch people up here, don't go anywhere. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'll tell them that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.